Hello, it's great to have you with us and thanks for joining us. This is Search for Truth, your 15 minute program of hymns and Bible study with your teacher, your Bible teacher, Brian Johnston. Over the last 10 weeks, Brian's been looking into the Bible to see how we might get to know God better and deepen our relationship with him. This time, Brian looks at certain Bible characters and how God, who knew them, distinguished between the genuine and the counterfeit. Brian draws lessons for ourselves too. And today's study is called A Worthy Distinction. Here's Brian. Thanks, John. Tennis players who win a record number of Grand Slams, footballers who win many Champions League medals, or athletes who win a record number of Olympic medals are all celebrated. We live today with style icons, media presenters, film stars, and so-called rock legends in a much less enduring celebrity culture. Even the notoriously wicked go down in infamy. But as we've already been thinking, it all pales into insignificance compared with one thing, and that one thing is being known by God. The Apostle Paul, when writing his second pastoral letter to Timothy, described some in the local church of God at Ephesus as being known by God. I want to explore with you in what sense he was saying this on that occasion. Before we come directly to that, it's going to be necessary to research a little bit of history. History that's recorded for us in the Bible book of Numbers, and it's chapter 16. It's the account of a rebellion among the ranks of God's people in the Old Testament at the time when Moses was their leader. And while the family of his brother Aaron had been singled out by God to represent the whole people as priests, it was the privilege, not to mention responsibility, of Aaron and his sons to draw near to God's altar and into the holy place of the tent of meeting where God lived among his people back then. It turns out that not everyone was content with that arrangement. It began among relatives and among some of those who already had their own appointed sphere of responsibility. This is what we read in Numbers chapter 16, quite a long reading. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they stood before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. They assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his group, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will make known who is his, and who is holy, and will bring that one near to himself. Indeed, the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Before we continue the reading, I want to just repeat and emphasise a part there that we will return to. Tomorrow morning, the Lord will make known who is his. That's what Moses said to Korah and his associates. So Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the areas around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram, with the elders of Israel following him, and he spoke to the congregation, saying, Get away now from the tents of these wicked men, and do not touch anything that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in all their sin. So they moved away from the areas around the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the entrances of their tents, along with their wives, their sons and their little ones. 
Then Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for it is not my doing. If these men die the death of all mankind, or if they suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with everything that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will know that these men have been disrespectful to the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, their households, and all the people who belonged to Korah with all their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. As we said, that's Numbers chapter 16, 1 to 35. Without doubt, that incident was well known to the Apostle Paul, and the Spirit of God brought it to his mind as he wrote to Timothy, who was grappling with pastoral problems in the local church at Ephesus. For Paul said this to Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, claiming that the resurrection has already taken place, and they are jeopardising the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to keep away from wickedness. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 to 19. And it's those last two expressions, the Lord knows those who are his, and Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to keep away from wickedness. It's those two expressions that seem so reminiscent of that much earlier rebellion among whom were found Dathan and Abiram. At Ephesus, it was a grouping within the church, of whom we are given just the two names, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Perhaps in part, this too was a rebellion against the established church order. It was certainly a dogmatic assertion of a strange teaching. What had started out as empty, worldly chatter had escalated into an ungodliness that was eating away at the vitals of the church like a cancer. A surgical intervention was called for. The cancer had to be cut out. The proponents of false, alternative teaching had to be removed from church fellowship. A house divided cannot stand. Opposing elements need to be isolated. The summary judgment in this instance was not the ground opening up to swallow the dissenting voices, but separating the church from them, and so separating them from the church. Those who gather to the Lord's name must remove themselves or purge themselves out from any wickedness and ungodliness. Ungodliness is wickedness. It's rebelling against God. Action must be swift and decisive. Little wonder then that Paul invoked the imagery of the classic showdown against rebels in Moses' day. Had God not made it so fearfully dramatic so that it would be forever etched in the national consciousness? But let's visit again the first expression Paul used. Remember, he'd affirmed, the Lord knows those who are his. And here we have the point we're exploring, namely, persons who are known by God. But we ask, who were they in this context? And what had brought them to God's attention that he might regard them favourably in this way? I think it's safe to assume that this is what's meant here that God was looking on those so described with approval. For of course, God in his omniscience knows everything and everyone. Surely then, this is God taking special notice of some. 
Something like this happened in the final days of the Old Testament, as recorded in the book of Malachi. We read, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened attentively and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and esteem his name. And they will be mine, says the Lord. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17. During that particular time of decline and apostasy, God was paying attention to those who were God-fearing. Surely he always does that. It was no different at Ephesus in the first century. God had been noting the faithful brothers in the church of God at Ephesus, where Timothy was working. They are mentioned in verse 2. Timothy is told to pass on the baton of teaching to reliable men. Then verse 15 talks about those working with God's word in a way that had God's approval, a way that God approved of. They were the accurate Bible teachers there. Later in the chapter, Paul goes on to mention vessels of honour and the Lord's bondservant. Is it not safe to conclude that running down throughout this chapter, all these are descriptions of those whom the Lord knew there as belonging to him, as being his? This didn't include all believers there. Specifically, it didn't include those like Hymenaeus and Philetus who'd gone astray from the truth. These two were men who seemed to have known the truth before going astray from it. Those known by the Lord in this sense, that is known with his approval, are all those whose faithful service is affirmed in their present service for him. Those who are sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now, that's something to aspire towards. To follow Christ faithfully, and be affirmed with knowing approval by his Father. Now, may I remind you, as usual, that there's a transcript book available of the 12 study talks in this series, so why not send for it? Then, if you use it, you'll be able to get more out of the radio talks. It's available online, and either you can get it yourself by downloading a copy from churchesofgod.info forward slash media, or if you're not able to do that and need to request a hard copy book, just write in and ask for the title, A Greater Sense of God. You can use email or the post, and here's our address. Search for Truth, Hayes Press, The Barn, Flaxlands, Royal Wootton Bassett, Swindon, SN4, 8DY, UK. Our email address is sft at churchesofgod.info. Thank you for being with us today and do join us again next week for our final talk in this series about gaining a greater sense of God. It's called Responding to Revelation. So till we'll see you next time then, it's goodbye and very best wishes from our Bible teacher Brian, our producer David, our singers and me, John. So see you again soon and in the meantime, we wish you God's richest blessings.